Hi everybody, I'm Bob Brager and I'd like to welcome you back to Amsterdam Writers Platform. We are here in the cool part of Amsterdam, the new cool part of Amsterdam, Amsterdam North, what some people are calling the Brooklyn of Amsterdam. We're at NDASM, the Netherlands Dockyards and Shipbuilding Company. The company was founded in 1922, when shipbuilding was moved over to this part of town, and by the 1950s, this was the biggest shipyard in Europe. But things change. In the 1980s, the shipyard went bankrupt. But since then, the city of Amsterdam has captured this territory, has taken over this place, to create a space for creativity, to create a space for freedom, freedom of the arts, freedom for festivals, freedom to start new businesses, the particular kind of freedom that Amsterdam has been good at historically. Our guest today is a distinguished writer, a journalist, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, a poet as it happens, and for six years he was the director of the John Adams Institute, which is the literary and cultural institute in Amsterdam. He's also the author of this terrific book, Amsterdam, a history of the world's most liberal city. I'm delighted to welcome Russell Shorthoff. Thank, Thank you, Bob. You, Thank you, Bob. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Lovely place. It's a great spot. Love what you've done with it. <laughs> <laughs> you worked very hard. Russell, let's just talk about the book. I read the book slowly. This is not a book that I can read quickly because every page of this book is, is narrative history. It's telling a story. It's telling a story about people in conflict. But the real thing that I was really in search of, the thing that I wanted to better understand, was the title. Your title, your subtitle, is A History of the World's Most Liberal City. And I, I, I'm not sure I know what that means. If you say liberal, is this like liberal in America? Like... Well, first of all, um, it's very common when I'm giving a talk about the book for a Dutch person, you, and somebody refers to the subtitle, The World's Most Liberal City, for a Dutch person to say, no, it isn't. Which, which I love. It's very Dutch to say, no, it isn't. Um, and uh, you know, so, first of all, what I mean by liberal, liberal is a one of these words that can shape shift. It can go in different directions. I mean it in its broadest understanding. Liberal, very broadly, is a word that describes a philosophy of individual freedom. Uh, lib liber, the Latin word for free. Uh, now, where it starts to get tricky is where, when you decide where you, what, you, what kind of freedom you're emphasizing. And then just to get back to the, uh, to the, um, the roots of it, and, and with the, du the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic in the old days, and Amsterdam in particular, what distinguished this part of Europe from most of the rest of Europe was the rest of Europe uh, through the Middle Ages had this feudal sy system in place, which was this collective system in which everybody had a certain place uh, where they, they lived and worked. Do you think and, we're different in, in the Netherlands yes. than in the rest of And it has to do with land. Uh, land, I mean, the feudal system, the, the economic component is called the manorial system. You had a manor house and you had a nobleman who lived in that right. house and there was lands and there were serfs who worked the land. Year. Yeah, and it, right. And, and, uh, and whether if you were a carpenter, if you were a peasant, if you were the nobleman in the castle, you were fixed in that position. Yes. Uh, your child, your grandchild, were going to occupy a similar position. Uh, and that was hundreds and hundreds of years. This part of the country, that system never took hold because the land is unstable. And because the land is unstable, eventually in the... Physic physically. Physically. Uh, but wait. It's a swamp. It's a... It's, it's, it's a... Originally where three rivers come in. That's right. Of Europe, this is a vast... This is a vast river delta. And every year what the medieval uh, inhabitants found was that, you know, in the spring their house was underwater or their land's underwater or, or there's new land where there wasn't before. So they needed stability. So they got together to build, as we, as many of us know, uh, dams and dikes and to create polders, to, to reclaim land. It was groups of people deciding to do this together and then in order to reinforce it, everybody, if you weren't yourself literally digging, you were paying money to support the effort. So, so they, that was the, inst the institution of what the Dutch still pay, a water tax. And as they came and they settled and they began to build these dams and dikes, 
They reclaimed land, and then you know the famous expression, God made the earth, but the Dutch made Holland. That's what they mean, very literally. And as you, if you travel around the Netherlands by highways or by train, I mean, you, often you're on a dike. I mean, the land, that land is a couple meters higher than what's around you, and you see it crisscrossed by the little trenches, of this very sophisticated system for keeping this land uh, land and not, and, and not underwater. So when that happened, after they had created this land, it wasn't owned by a nobleman. It wasn't owned by a church. They didn't want it. It was owned by the people who, well, it hadn't existed before. Right. And so the people who made it, we're divided it up. 1300s, 1400s. Well, it, well, you know, it starts probably around 900. Yeah. Uh, but where you start to see records is around 1200. Yeah. And um, so then they divide it up. The Renaissance. Actually. And their Renaissance. Their Renaissance. <laughs> and uh, they start to divide it up into lots. And then they start to do things with the lots. They buy and sell the lots to each other. And then they decide that what can you do with this? Well, for one thing, it's very good meadow for grazing cows. Yeah. And that means you can develop an industry for uh, butter and cheese. And that means, that leads to something else, which is Dutch cleanliness. Because you have to be very clean to make butter and cheese, you know? So you had kind of a proto-modern real estate-based economy. And, and, other, and this is what you see reflected, I think, when you look at the uh, diaries and letters of travelers from other parts of Europe who come here and they don't know what to make of these people because uh, this then sets off, you know, this land thing yeah. triggers uh, similar ki a kind of innovative instinct yeah. in other arenas. Right. And so they become good at small businesses and, yes. and at making money. And so other Europeans come and they don't know it's different. And remember that these other people are, you know, I'm a carpenter because my father was a carpenter or, or whatever they are. Uh, so they're not used to that kind of individual. I mean, this is a very, it's, it's hard to comprehend the, this difference um, now because it's normal. Now everybody understands, well, I'll go start a business. Um, but other Europeans didn't get it. And uh, so then they start to try to account for it by saying the Dutch are greedy or, or the Dutch are godless. I mean, the Dutch were, as religion soaked as everyone else, I think, at that time. But they're tr you can see them trying to account for it. For one thing, this is, these, this is the low countries, and it's easy to run to. It's easy to, if you're fleeing war somewhere else or religious persecution, it's relatively easy. And as uh, this, this uh, cycle started going, and these provinces, because remember these were provinces at the time, they're not one nation. Yeah. Uh, and as they start to, you know, build this economic might, yeah. then it's a place to come to to look for work. Yeah. And, as it and as it becomes this uh, shipping empire, yes. then there's a lot of people coming here to work in it or to go out on ships. What you seem to be saying in the book is that the basic pragmatism of these people in coming together to, to, to create the land, to create land, hold it, to control the water, created communal systems, but also empowered the individual mm -hmm. in such a way that the, the structures of the rest of the world didn't, the rest of Europe didn't seem to apply. And you, you're saying that there's a DNA here that, that has lasted for centuries, that has, uh, was brought to America in, in the, the, uh, the Dutch period in New York and in that mm -hmm. part of the world, that, that is special and that is different. You, I mean, if you think about the story of European history and what we have inherited, um, it starts with the ancient Greeks and the Romans, and then and then you get the uh, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages preserving knowledge, and then you come to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and uh, so all of that. But if you think about it, that's really kind of a Mediterranean story. Yes. There was another story, the North Sea story, yeah. uh, and those you know, north of England, Scotland, the the Dutch provinces, uh, northern Germany, uh, Iceland. I mean, things were going on in these places as well, which also fed into, you know, who and what we are today. Um, and so this is part of that northern story, and it's it's a story of people who are on the margins, who are on the on the coasts, who were on the outs, who didn't have the desirable land. Geographically on the margins. Yeah, literally. Um, and, uh, 
And, but because of that, they kind of turned it to advantage. They yeah. turned this problem of water. I mean, that's what, like, we're in Amsterdam and with the canals, that's like this marvelous illustration of turning a problem into an advantage. Yes, it's amazing. It's yeah. really amazing. But it's, the real question now is, is this just interesting history mm -hmm. or does it have anything to do with today? Things have changed so much. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of intolerance in Holland. The yeah. thing that they've been so proud of is in serious doubt. The Jews certainly suffered during the Holocaust. The North African Muslims are discriminated against now. And in prior times, Catholics suffered as well. So a lot of it has been, if the intolerance has been honored and breached, so to speak. Mm -hmm. One thing that's behind a lot of this is this Dutch notion, this notion of Dutch tolerance, uh, which uh, helped to foster a lot of what we're talking about. But tolerance was never this all-inclusive, all-embracing, we love everybody because we're so wise kind of thing. It was a practical philosophy. It had a, it had a, a, a moral layer to it, which came out of the, the war against Spain and you know people who said, we know what God wants and God wants our faith and so therefore we shouldn't tolerate others. And then you had the, the remonstrance, the kind of left wing, who said, well, wait, the Spanish Inquisition who came through murdering a lot of us, they yeah. thought they knew what God wanted. Yeah. So maybe we should be a little bit more humble about exactly. what we think God wants. The Netherlands is still a lot like other European societies compared to, say, American society, where American society has for hundreds of years been a society that's mixed. Uh, so an American, I mean, sure, there are a lot of people who say if you're, you're only American, if you, in, it was in, in a, a way it was. The modern nation was born. That's right. And so a problem that the Dutch have, which the French have and the Germans yes. have, is that there are some people who, in the back of their minds, think you're only really Dutch or French or German if your grandmother was and your grandmother spoke that language exactly. and that kind of thing. Exactly. So that is, that is something that underlies the, uh, the intolerance right now.